Welcome to Her Story, a retelling of the biblical narratives featuring women in scripture with Joanne Guarnieri Hagemeyer, Grace and Peace Joanne. Ruth's story takes place at some point during the time of the judges. Hers is a tale of redemption, for God redeemed Ruth and through her redeemed Naomi as well. Boaz, kinsman redeemer, was himself also redeemed. Let's see how in the enduring narrative of these Exodus pioneers within the book of Ruth. Each story in this series was originally produced as a YouTube presentation. Links to YouTube, Grace and Peace Joanne blog posts, and the books I've written are provided below. Death is one of the more tragic losses all of us experience in life. That final goodbye with someone we love dearly and the long years of their absence to come. Even though death is part of every life, it can still feel like an affront. And more often than not, you and I are just not ready. Not ready to let go of that relationship and that person. And so it was for Naomi, and surely for her two daughters-in-law. Death had robbed them of their husbands, but also their places in society. Widowed, with no children, there was no home left for them and few options for making a living. Yet out of that darkest valley came God's light. Ruth's story begins with her being utterly bereft of all but faith, and next moves to her relationship with Boaz, a kind-hearted farmer who took care of both Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. Boaz then became even more, as he formally redeemed the land, name, and heritage of Naomi's dead husband. Because at the end of Ruth's story, she places her firstborn son, Obed, on Naomi's knee. So let's begin with bereft but faithful. The first chapter of Ruth. Now Ruth was from Moab, a mountainous region known for its limestone hills and scarcity of trees and plentiful rain in what is today the country of Jordan, along the eastern shore of the Dead Sea. And it was here on Mount Nebo that Moses had gazed into the promised land before he died. Now, shortly before then, Moses had marched the people through the land of the Amorites, conquering them and claiming much of their territory. It was land the Amorites had already first taken from the Moabites, as recorded in the Book of Numbers, but also the Meshe Stele, which you can see here, or the Moabite stone. So in Numbers it says, For Heshbon was the city of King Zion of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and captured all his land as far as the Arnon. And so it was here that the tribes of Reuben and Gad decided to settle. Now Balak, king of Moab, became terrified that he was going to lose the rest of his territory. So he hired a seer named Balaam to curse the Hebrew tribes. But instead, God spoke powerfully through Balaam and blessed the Israelites instead. So in a last desperate attempt to outmaneuver the Israelites, Balak sent women from Moab to seduce the Hebrew men and entice them into worshiping Chemosh, Moab's god. And that whole story, their story, is found in Numbers 25. The results of Balaam's and King Balak's devious device proved disastrous for both nations. Ammon, the nation to the north, and Moab shared the same origin history. So according to the Bible, when Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain were destroyed, the only inhabitants who escaped that cataclysm were Lot and his two daughters. Fearing they would never marry or have families of their own, both of these daughters seduced their father Lot and conceived sons. One was Ammon and the other was Moab, half-brothers. And eventually, they established their namesake nations. Sadly, even though these three people groups, the Israelites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites, all shared similar ancestry, there was no love lost between them, and usually their borders were closed to each other. So Ruth's story takes place probably very early in Israel's history, during the Middle Bronze Age, when the 12 tribes were still trying to coalesce into a nation, and there was a rare peace existing just for that time period between Moab and Israel. Over the span of those first 300 years, God raised up 12 leaders to rescue the Israelites. These were men and women who championed the deliverance of God's people from war and slavery 
and it was a rough and tumble era in Israel's history when God's covenant faithfulness to the people was marked by grace, rescue, long-suffering love, and faithfulness as the people struggled to gain a foothold in the land God had promised to them. Reading through the stories of these judges, a pattern emerges, a cycle that began with such phrases as, the people did evil in the sight of the Lord, or everyone did as they saw fit. This would result in God handing them over to the consequences of their straying, which is something that God had warned them God would do, sovereignly allowing the oppression of foreign enemies to chasten God's own people. The Israelites would finally cry out to the Lord in pain and remorse, and that always prompted the Lord's compassion in raising up a champion, a judge, who would rescue and restore God's people. The end of the cycle would always be the land had peace for so many years. So Ruth grew up during a particularly relentless drought, possibly somewhere between 1191 and 1144 BC. Just a few years ago, 2013, scientists established a link between ancient pollen samples and a major lengthy famine in that region during exactly this time. And added to the severe and prolonged drought was a desperate competition for scarce resources. Whenever the Israelites put in seed, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them, and they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the land as far as the neighborhood of Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they and their livestock would come up, and they would even bring their tents as thick as locusts. Neither they nor their camels could be counted, so they wasted the land as they came in. Thus, Israel was greatly impoverished because of Midian, and the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. And Gideon, who was a man something like Moses, was raised up by God to rescue the Hebrew tribes from the threat of the Ammonites. And the famine was so severe that Elimelech, a man living in Bethlehem, felt compelled to take his wife Naomi, along with their two sons, to Moab in search of food. And while they were living in Moab, Elimelech died, leaving Naomi to raise their two sons alone. Both boys eventually married Moabite women, and then somehow something happened which caused both of Naomi's sons to die too, leaving Naomi alone and destitute with her two widowed daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah. And at this point, Naomi decided to return to Bethlehem because she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. So they all three started out together, but something happened that caused Naomi to change her mind. Was it the journey? Or did Naomi have growing fears that maybe her Moabite daughters-in-law would not be accepted in Bethlehem? Or did she begin to wonder how the three of them could make a living without husbands to help them? Whatever it was, Naomi abruptly changed plans, and now she urged Ruth and Orpah to stay in Moab to remarry there and make a life for themselves. There were many tears and many warm embraces, and Naomi listed all the things that had been weighing heavily on her mind and her heart. She was old. She had no husband. She had no sons. There was no place left for her in society. But most grievous of all, Naomi revealed her deepest sorrow. It has been for me far more bitter than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Eventually, Orpah did reluctantly return to her home, but Ruth was intent on giving up everything life could hold for her in Moab a new husband and family, her own people and religion and culture, to be close to God through Naomi. She pleaded with her mother-in-law in what has become one of the more famous passages in the Hebrew Scriptures. Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. 
May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. Now, there are times in all of our lives when sorrow and tragedy roll over us and it seems God's favor has been taken away, when joy is a fading memory and grief our only companion. What must Naomi have felt when she heard Ruth's impassioned plea? Was she simply too heartworn and tired to argue? Might she have recognized God's voice in Ruth's words? Many centuries later, the Apostle Paul would write, Encourage one another and build each other up. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with all of them. Both women needed each other. Naomi to once again remember God's love for her and Ruth to become fully a part of God's people. There are many reasons why God allows suffering. Here are just a few thoughts inspired by Luis Palau's book, Where is God When Bad Things Happen? First of all, accidents and calamities and tragedies are an unavoidable part of the life of the imperfect people living in an imperfect world. And you and I suffer when we make poor choices and wrong decisions, whether in ignorance or lack of wisdom or impulse, poor guidance and counsel or some other reason. The result often involves suffering. Suffering also comes from the deliberate rejection of God's ways and word. Believers and non-believers alike are capable of intentionally, mindfully determining to go against God in matter. And sometimes it's someone else close to us who has rebelled against God's ways and God's words. Or maybe they made an ignorant decision or an unwise decision or just, you know, a wrong decision. You and I suffer those consequences too when we share the life with that person or those people. And there are times, as in Job's case, when our suffering stems from God's cosmic and eternal objectives. On occasion, God is bringing discipline into our lives that will conform our character to Christ and bring our personality to maturity and deepen our wisdom and compassion and enable us to fully fulfill our design and our purpose and exercise our spiritual gifts and our innate talents. Discipline often involves suffering but it's being worked together for our good. And finally, there are circumstances in which God could be protecting you and me from something even worse down the road. And maybe that was Naomi's case. Maybe Elimelech's decision meant that rather than the whole family die of famine, at least Naomi would have the chance to live long enough to bring Ruth back to Bethlehem. Maybe that was what God was doing all along. Whatever the rest of their journey may have been like, Naomi's spirits must not have been lifted because when she and her daughter-in-law finally arrived in Bethlehem and the whole town joyfully came out to greet the Naomi they remembered with love and respect, honor, all she could talk about was what God had taken from her. Call me no longer pleasant. Call me bitter. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me pleasant when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Well, that brings us to Ruth chapter 2, where we meet Boaz the farmer. Ruth was devoted to her mother-in-law in every way, giving her companionship and care, gleaning in the fields every day to feed them, and being humbly obedient to Naomi's wishes. But God was also at work on their behalf, because what only seemed to be chance was truly the Lord's gentle guidance. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. And just then, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Godly Boaz immediately noticed the young Moabite, modestly trailing behind his reapers, and he spoke personally with her, commending her character, uh, commending her faith and her loyalty to Naomi, and he said to her, May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Boaz reassured Ruth of his intention to protect her and provide for her, and he 
ordered water to be made available for her, and he invited her to his table, and he instructed his servants to make sure she went home with enough grain each day. And Ruth worked hard. The servants noted to Boaz, she's been on her feet from early this morning until now without resting even for a moment. And she gleaned all the way until evening, and she beat out what she'd gathered, a full ephah, or bushel of barley, and then she carried that bushel, 50 pounds worth of barley, all the way back to Naomi's house. Well, Naomi instantly recognized God's favor. Blessed be the man who took notice of you, she exclaimed, when she saw that full bushel of grain. But after she heard Ruth's story, Naomi's heart was warmed. Blessed be he by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Out of her great, and to many of us, unimaginable loss of her husband and both of her sons and her place in life and any inheritance, Naomi found God had stirred hope in her, the dead. Well, then came a bounty of favor. When all the harvest had come in and Ruth would no longer be able to glean, Naomi knew they both needed a more permanent solution. So Naomi prepared Ruth to signal to Boaz that Naomi hoped he would be their kinsman redeemer under Israel's leveret law. When brothers reside together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her, taking her in marriage and performing the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the firstborn whom she bears shall succeed to the name of the deceased brother, so that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. Naomi must have been well loved, in addition to being well known in her village, because it seems she and Ruth had been permitted to live in Elimelech's house, even though he died, and his sons had died too. However, Without a husband and sons, Naomi had no legal recourse to claim Elimelech's land, to farm it or even to live on the proceeds of renting it out. And Ruth, as a Moabite, had no place at all in Bethlehem. But she had gained the respect of the whole village, and of Boaz in particular for her devotion to Naomi, and also to God. But Ruth, by rights, could not invoke the Leveret Law. And the one who could the widow of the owner of the land was too old to invoke the leveret law because she was long past childbearing years. So they both were at the mercy of the village elders and of Boaz's compassion. Naomi now had consistently referred to Ruth as her daughter. So she was acknowledging Ruth's family tie by covenant of marriage, but also by faith in God and faithfulness to Naomi. So Naomi sent Ruth as Naomi's proxy to Boaz with a particular request to spread the cloak of his protection over Ruth and by proxy Naomi. The greater meaning was going to be clear to him. As next of kin, he was being asked to redeem Elimelech's land as well as Elimelech's name. Understanding the legalities of this request, though, Boaz reminded Ruth, and through Ruth, Naomi, there was a closer next of kin. Either way, however, Boaz would pursue the matter and make sure that a leveret marriage was negotiated on their behalf. So there's kind of a counterplay going on here in this text between Boaz as himself, Boaz as next of kin, and Boaz as a man. First, Naomi instructed Ruth to wash and anoint herself, to put on her best clothes, to go down to the threshing floor, where evidently women were forbidden, and approach Boaz once he'd eaten and drunk and laid himself down for the night. She was to uncover his feet, and she was to wait for Boaz's directions. In all of these instructions, Naomi referred to Boaz as a man. Now, it's possible this inference is meant to identify Boaz by his sex as a man who would be interested in a beautiful anointed woman lying next to him in the dark of night. Ruth's compliance in every detail to Naomi's guidance brought her to Boaz's feet, unbeknownst to him. And once the wine had worn off 
right around midnight, the man woke up and he was startled to find a woman pressed against him. And in their whispered exchange in the velvety night hours, it was revealed that Ruth was willing to forego young romance because of her great love for Naomi, to restore Naomi's dead husband's name and lands. She understood that her first son would really be Naomi's. This was all for Naomi. So the middle-aged Boaz called Ruth daughter. He was also acknowledging her covenantal relationship to Naomi and to the village, and he praised her loyalty to the point of sacrificing her own future. He said, I will do for you all that you ask, for all the assembly of my people know that you are a worthy woman. And then Boaz promised to mediate a leveret marriage for Naomi with Ruth as proxy, either with the legally closest next of kin or with himself. In the meantime, his instruction to have her remain the night may have been for her protection. Now, some have argued the possibility that Ruth lying by Boaz's feet was a euphemism for a sexual encounter. However, by spreading his cloak over Ruth and calling her daughter, Boaz was acting as a protector, in more of a fatherly way, really, than as a lover, in anticipation of a marriage that might not be secure due to the legal right of the first refusal of that closer kinsman. Furthermore, if Boaz had sex with Ruth, this would have rendered her unacceptable to the closer next of kin because she would no longer be the widow of her deceased husband, but would now be either a prostitute or a concubine to Boaz. And finally, as a next of kin, Boaz was responsible to protect Ruth. So there is real merit in reading Boaz as a good and honorable man who loved and lived by God's word. And that brings us to the birth of Obed in Ruth 4. The next of kin was happy to provide the fee to redeem Elimelech's land when it involved only Naomi, because she could bear no heirs. That meant Elimelech's name would fade away, and the land would revert to the next of kin's own sons. But when he learned that Ruth would be Naomi's proxy, he quickly recanted, I cannot redeem it for myself without damaging my own inheritance. Because why? Not only would that money go out to redeem the land, but the land would go to an offspring that was really supposed to replace Elimelech. So he said, take my right of redemption yourself, because I cannot redeem it. Again, God was at work, gently guiding. The marriage between Boaz and Ruth received the entire village's blessing, the approbation of the elders, and even the willing assent of the next of kin. Ruth could have had no idea how she would fit into God's majestic plan of salvation for all people, even for her people, the Gentile Moabites, all Gentiles. But she did know that God was good, that the Lord was like no other God, and that God was worth giving everything else up for. The story of Ruth is one of redemption. In fact, that word redemption shows up 23 times in this little book of only four chapters. Because Ruth wanted so much to belong to God and to God's people, the Lord redeemed her from the very edges of society, from widowhood and childlessness, and placed her in the lineage of God's own son. Boaz is called the kinsman redeemer. In a type of Christ, he did offer redemption to a woman who otherwise would have had no hope of marriage and family, really two women. Yet the middle-aged man Boaz also experienced redemption in marrying a young woman of such depth of character and love. And Naomi experienced redemption from her life of desolation, bereft of husbands, sons, and country, through the devotion of Ruth and the kindness of Boaz. Her status was redeemed in society by the marriage of her daughter-in-law to a kinsman, by the birth of her grandson, and by the increase even in her standard of living, no longer gleaning and begging, but living well. Even Elimelech was redeemed. Because even though he had died in a foreign land, God redeemed his name and his inheritance through his kinsman Boaz and for all eternity through Christ. 
for the very end of this story points to the lineage of Israel's most beloved king, David. His inheritance or his lineage went from Boaz to Obed, from Obed to Jesse, and from Jesse to David. When you and I are in that deep valley of the shadow of death, it is hard to even imagine light could penetrate there, to even imagine there is anything left to hope for. Yet Ruth's story tells us there is, in a paraphrase of the Apostle John's testimony, in Jesus is life, and the life is the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot, will not, overcome it. She was powerful and patriotic, a woman kings respected and came to for help. Except she was not Samson's friend, but his foe. Meet Delilah, a worthy opponent in the Exodus pioneers.